How did the experience of warfare change between 1700 and 1850? In particular, we're going to be focusing on recruitment, training, and the impact of war on civilians. And again, be looking for examples of change, of continuity, looking for trends, and looking for turning points. In 1800, Britain had a paid standing army. This meant there was not a huge amount of change in recruitment over the next 150 years, certainly for the standard army. So recruitment was more simple and stayed the same for the next 150 years. Officers were young men from wealthy families who bought them a commission to be an officer in the army. To be a higher ranking officer cost a lot and so was only open to the richest people in society. The status, lifestyle and long term income of an officer was very good so people bought these commissions to give them a good life opportunity. However, this often led to officers not always being of the highest quality because it wasn't the most talented people who became officers, just the richest. The recruitment to the normal soldier positions was also quite flawed. Men could sign up for short enlistments of 8 to 12 years or they could sign up for life in the army, which would normally mean about 21 years. But recruitment was difficult and the army struggled to get up to its required size in this time, mainly due to the low pay. Pay remained about eight pence a day, um, which is equivalent to about three pounds per day today, and it was less than the labourer's pay. Also, in peacetime, the soldier had to pay for his lodgings and equipment, so actually it was not a very good salary. To counter this, recruiters used bounties, typically worth around three pounds, um, which would be about £250 a day, um, to pay to the soldiers up front to encourage soldiers to sign. Alternatively, the recruiters would get men drunk in pubs and then get them to sign up under the influence. During wartime, criminals and debtors were released early from prison if they signed up to the army. Um, during the American War of Independence, three whole regiments, about 7,000 men in total, were raised in this way. However, this led to a low quality of recruits and desertions being very, very common. And officers often had to resort to very harsh discipline to control their troops, ultimately because many of them did not want to be there. That soldiers were recruited at this time. First of all, there was the Colonel's Regiments, which is when a senior officer was given a large sum of money to recruit and train a unit of soldiers. So they would have to get the soldiers in, pay for their training, clothe and equip a whole regiment. Now, they did this to avoid upsetting public opinion, who didn't want a large standing army, and these soldiers would do this to try and make a profit, because they would keep any money they did not spend on recruiting and training these troops. However, you can see already this might lead to them cutting corners and not paying the men enough, or training them as well as they should be. A second way to ensure that there was enough men was the 1757 Militia Act, which created a local militia from the men aged 18 to 50 in each county to serve for five years at a time to defend their county. Now, this was very useful for boosting the army and protecting against invasion, and could be used to, in wartime to ensure there's enough men. Um, and sometimes the militia grew up to almost 120,000 men. So it's a long-term kind of way of recruiting, um, not dissimilar to the assize of arms or the militias in previous years but just like in previous years the militias were also often unpopular and often not as well trained as the regular army. Training was an area where there was a lot of work to try and improve things. First of all in 1708 the Duke of Marlborough issued a manual of tactics for officers called the new exercise of firelocks and bayonets However, not many officers actually used it to train themselves or their troops about tactics. Similarly, between 1728 and 1851, George II issued a series of regulations for the whole army to use, but again, often these were ignored by the army. More successfully, a Royal Military Academy was set up in Woolwich in 1741 to teach the difficult skill of gunnery, which had some impact in this area. There's also some developments to do with the wars against France, where troops were taught standard drills for manoeuvring in 1792 for infantry, 1795 for cavalry, 
and actually some guidelines about the use of swords and rifles were issued in 1797. Many of these were still resisted by independent-minded officers, but you can see that people were trying to standardise their approach. And lastly, in 1800, the Royal Military College was established at Sandhurst, which at first was set up to train existing officers and to improve their training. But then in 1802, a junior department was added for cadets who were trained to be officers. Overall, attitudes in society prevented change. Officers thought that weapons training and tactics were simple things that could be left to arrange amongst the troops themselves. So although there were some attempts at improving training, it was never consistent. Civilians in this time remained minimal. Civilian deaths remained very, very few as there was little or no fighting in England. And effectively, the English Channel and the British Navy protected Britain from invasion. And so the impact, or direct impact, on civilians was minor. Recruitment was still an issue. There were many people disliking the Militia Act, and in fact, in 1757, there were riots when people feared that they might be sent abroad to fight. So, recruitment still affected civilians in quite a major way. Similarly, requisitioning carried on. The army had no transport of its own, so it relied upon requisitioning from civilians any wagons or any other equipment it needed to transport its supplies impacts such as accommodation. So in 1700 there was no accommodation for the army and soldiers had to lodge with civilians, often causing trouble in their lodgings. From 1800 however barracks, which were bases with accommodation, became common to house the soldiers improving this area. Taxation in peacetime would have had to increase as the army went from costing 1 million in 1700 per year to 8 million by 1836. However it's arguable that this did not have a huge impact on the population as the population increased as it was a more prosper and it was a more prosperous time so the taxation burden would not have been too heavy taxation in wartime was worse as the cost of the army could soar to 25 million per year in wartime so in summary officers paid for their commission and so came from wealthy families Normal soldiers signed up for life or 8 to 12 years, but low pay normally meant poor quality. So there were still issues with recruitment, even though there was now a standing army. The government used colonel's regiments to recruit troops cheaply, and still had the 1757 Militia Act to ensure that each county had troops to serve when needed. Attempts to improve training achieved very little in this time, although some standard drills and training centres for gunners and officers were set up. And there was little change in the impact for civilians. Those soldiers no longer stayed with ordinary people and the cost of the army increased as it was now a standing army.